Hello, everybody. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this um, lecture in the Old School House series. So my name is Gabachia Moreno, and I'll be your host tonight on behalf of the Desert Institute. And I'm really excited to have our guest, uh, Julia Sysak, talking about the history of off-roading in the Mojave. So the Old School House Lecture Series is a partnership between the 29 Palms Historical Society and the Desert Institute. And this series actually began 17 years ago. Tonight's program is one of 10 monthly lectures and discussions that will be held on the second Fridays of the month. And I wanna take a minute to introduce our guest tonight. Julia Sysak is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research concerns contemporary land use and conflicts over land management in the Eastern Mojave Desert in Southern California. As part of her research, Julia has worked with a number of local desert organizations, including the Native American Land Conservancy, Coachella Valley History Museum, Mojave Desert Land Trust, and 29 Palms Historical Society. And before we begin and get into the heated topic of the off-road, we want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have stewarded the land that we are on for time immemorial. So for Joshua Tree National Park, I would like to acknowledge the Mojave, Cahuilla, Serrano, and Chemuevi people. For Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I'm tuning in from, I want to acknowledge the Jicarilla Apache and the Pueblo people. And uh, mm -hmm. Julia, I would like to hand yeah, it off to you. I am uh, ca calling in from the Bay Area in California, which is Chuchenyo Ohlone territory. Thank you so much. This event is possible. Thank you to the support from the Desert Institute. And for those of you who are new to the Desert Institute, we are the educational branch of the Joshua Tree National Park Association dedicated to bringing educational, cultural, and artistic programs to the field within Joshua Tree National Park and its surrounding areas. And of course, also to the virtual world amidst our uh, current state of COVID. Um, Last thing before we get into the topic of tonight's lecture, I want to say a little bit about the rules of the chat and the live. So first of all, I wanna ask everyone to be nice. Uh, please use the chat, please leave comments. If you have any questions, there's a little ask a question button that you can click on and submit. That makes it very easy for us at the end of the lecture to go through those questions and make sure that we don't miss anything, which, that can happen if you're asking questions on the chat. Uh, in case we get disconnected, please wait a little bit and refresh your browser. We'll do everything in our power to get back online. And yes, you can just trust that we will. So just keep refreshing until you see us there again. Uh, last but not least, we are working on facilitating the replay of the presentation. So if for any reason you have to leave early today, know that it will be available for you to rewatch at another time. And without much further ado, Julia, I'm going to transfer over to you for the presentation. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. I am really excited to be giving you this talk today. So um, I'm just going to be sharing my screen with you so that you can all see what I'm seeing and eventually hear what I'm hearing as well. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. All right, so with an introduction, which is entitled, For the Sake of Time as Well as My Own Sanity. A couple of years ago, I was talking to one of my friends about WEMO, also known as the West Mojave Route Network Plan, an ongoing planning process managed by the Bureau of Land Management. She just couldn't understand, she told me, why it seemed like no one cared about WEMO anymore. Her enthusiasm almost made WEMO, what others understood to be a totally intractable bureaucratic process, to be exciting. As you can see on this map, um, WEMO is massive, covering the red portion of the map of Southern California on the left in the detailed, um, and then detailed in the map that's on the right. 
WEMA, which is a contemporary planning process covering 9.4 million acres, that's more than 9% of California by landmass, is not only massive spatially, but temporally. Its record spans decades since it was started in 1991, and few people have continually worked on WEMO since it began almost 30 years ago. At one point, I personally mistakenly believed that I could understand the decades-long planning process and its litigation, and I began reading hundreds of pages of old court cases, planning documents, and newspaper articles, trying to understand why this process, which was actually begun in the same year I was born, was still pl taking place today. During this research, I found a quote that seemed to encapsulate the vertiginous feeling I experienced staring down all these documents, the confusion of trying to keep straight everything that was happening, and a quote from a 1987 Bureau of Land Management report. Quote, enter the 1982 Desert Plan Amendment to the Motorized Vehicle Access Element. For the sake of time, as well as my own sanity, I am not going to attempt to explain this amendment to you here. In concept, it represents a somewhat perverted definition of designated routes and trails by attempting to identify and designate all roads and trails in the desert while maintaining a user perception of existing roads and trails, knowing it could never fully accomplish the first task, end quote. In the court case in which I read this uh, quote, which was excerpted, this quote was used as an example of the problem of knowledge in the California desert. How no one could know whether the what was a road and what was a wash decades before. Was something a road or was it a place where some dirt bikers rode a couple of times? Is it a wash, a natural area where vegetation doesn't grow, or was it a road? They would never know. The reason why I start this talk with this quote is to give you an idea of just how partial this look into the history of dirt biking and off-roading in California is how people have spent entire careers within this span and not even seen their projects come to pass. While I have personally felt the temporary insanity that this Bureau of Land Management or BLM in this talk employee, I do not expect you to feel so lost today. Instead, like a good historian, my goal is to give you a kind of arc through which to understand the intertwined rise and fall of dirt biking and environmentalism in California, in which I argue are tightly linked in the story of how it came to be an end of the freewheeling use of public lands. This is a story, perhaps most importantly for me, about the place that the California desert plays in the lives of city people, how the desert is a place of leisure and recreation. But it's also a story about motorcycle technology, the rise of an anti-government right, and of course, the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act of 1976. I've organized this talk into four different parts, uh, tracking the rise of off-highway vehicles and more specifically dirt bikes, um, and then how these uh, different vehicles are understood in American culture and what exactly they have done in the desert. Finally, before I officially begin, I'd like to thank all the people who I interviewed, uh, many of whom appear throughout this talk, as well as the various archives that I went to to find all of this research. So that includes the Huntington Library, the National Archives at Riverside, UCLA's archives, the 29 Palms Historical Society, the San Bernardino City Library, and the Bancroft Library. I do flag some of those uh, locations of archives throughout the talk in case it's something of interest. So part one, motorcycles, the military, and the lonely crowd, 1940 through 1953. While dirt biking was a competition sport in Los Angeles since at least the late 1910s, the American bikes that then dominated the market were hard and heavy to maneuver in the desert. To make them more rideable, you often had to use your feet to navigate rocks and plants, and so riders would actually bob their rides, cutting off the excess weight. Other factors, like the hand-operated gear shift levers, which meant that you had to take your hands off of the handlebars in order to shift gears were not ideal for desert riders who didn't want to have to take their hands off to switch gears while they're navigating something challenging. The technology problem in the early 20th century really hindered desert riding as only the most dedicated people would make it into the desert with their rides. The shift, as far as I can tell, came with General George Patton as much as anything. During World War II, he proposed and accomplished a desert training center in the desert portions of California, Arizona, and Nevada as a kind of stand-in for the North African Front. And you can see a map of that here on this slide. 
The 11 million acres trained at least a million men for World War II. In the desert, they created bombing ranges, tent cities, and tank training grounds that left last lasting scars on the California desert, even as Patton assumed that the damage would eventually be blown away in the wind. Patton's men learned lots of skills, like how not to freeze in the desert or overheat, which often happened in the same day. But it was really, it was a challenging time for all these men in the desert, which was reflected in a 1943 report from the Office of War Services of the Federal Security Agency, which issued a guide to offer officers that outlined the recreational opportunities for soldiers in towns neighboring the desert training center. The report showed how the military valued certain kinds of recreation as a morale boosting opportunity during wartime. And so there were three different epigraphs of this report, one from the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, about winning the war, another defining what recreation actually meant from the Federal Security Administration, and a third from an editorial that emphasized the value of recreation to morale building during times of war. This weird mishmash of nationalism, recreation, and morale hinted at what was going to become a post-war obsession the balance of work and leisure. When these men came back from the war, their times of adventure were traded for gray flannel suits, also the name of a best-selling 1955 novel about a soldier returning from the war to a world dominated by business. Sloan Wilson's novel, here on the left, was turned into a Gregory Peck movie, here on the right, which reflected a broader preoccupation in post-war sociology with the appropriate balance of work and leisure time. David Reisman, uh, Nathan, Nathan Glazier, and Rule Denny's The Lonely Crowd, which came out in 1950, was a work of the era. It was a landmark study about the emergence of this new middle class. Selling more copies than any sociology book in the 20th century, The Lonely Crowd tapped into anxieties about the condition of American society among ordinary uh, Americans and academics alike. In the book, they argued that the current moment, one which would later be called an era of high consumption, was both a new kind of society marked by the emergence of a middle class and people who were defined through their consumption, not through their production. The Lonely Crowd was only one book that was concerned with how people spent their leisure time, along with other aptly named books like Work and Its Discontents, in which leading sociologist Daniel Bell made an elaborate typology of non-work time and argued about what it all meant. He said that some kinds of non-work time, what he called play, were not actually rest time for work, but rather a result of a lack of satisfaction at work or alienation. The need for this kind of reckless play came from understimulating work, he argued. Further, for all these men who returned from the war to new suburbs, all they wanted to do was get away from the new cookie cutter developments in the life that they represented, especially in fast growing California. For some, the figure of getting away was represented by cowboy movies, but for others by rebellious movie stars. Which brings us to part two, Marlon Brando and Steve McQueen. Oh, we'll keep it back on that last slide. Okay. The man who epitomized the white working class in the mid 20th century was Marlon Brando. His performances in A Streetcar Named Desire had already established him as such, but the 1953 film, The Wild One, was different. The film, which was actually banned in Great Britain for 14 years after it came out, was a film about moral panic. In the film, Brando was Johnny, a triumph running motorcycle gang boss in a situation that was a fictional retelling of the Hollister riots, a famous contestation between motorcyclists and police during a weekend of motorcycle racing in Hollister, California in 1947. The riot itself was seen to be captured in a single image, this one, which is a staged photo in which a drunken man sits atop a bike surrounded by bottles of beer. The film was filled with the kind of lawless, you know, disaffected youth that Johnny and his crew also represented. The film's most famous line is when a girl asks Johnny why he's rebelling, which I'll let you see for yourself in this little clip. Tell me what that means, BRMC. What does it mean? Black Rebels Motorcycle Club. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> hey, Johnny, why are you rebelling again? What do you got? 
All right. So as you can see, uh, he's not really rebelling against anything, right? Um, so the, although the wild one and other representations of Hollister were more extreme in how they showed motorcycling, they did reflect certain truths about the sport, which was dominated by working class and middle class bachelors after the war. Men who motorcycled were outlaws associated with vagrancy and uneven employment in the late 1940s. They were masterless men who posed a threat to the social order. In a time of big social change, it made sense that a movie like The Wild One would be banned for the risk of encouraging such masterless men. And like their on-road counterparts, dirt bikers of the 1950s considered themselves working class. The motorcycles were often their only vehicles, but had to be modified before they could be ridden off-road, since lighter weight vehicles, as I already mentioned, were better for maneuvering in the desert. In addition to aiding in off-road driving, modifications were also a certain kind of status markers. Dirt bikers were proud that they were able to work with their hands to modify their bikes. This pride in workmanship continued even after Japanese bikes, which were advertised as low maintenance and inexpensive alternatives to European options, hit the market in the 1960s and soon became to, came to dominate the dirt biking scene, especially by the end of the 60s. In this story of the expansion of motorcycling and dirt biking in America, the Japanese import market actually plays a very large role. When Hondas were first sold in the United States, they came with a positive publicity complaint campaign. You meet the nicest people on Honda. While this campaign started out with paper ads in newspapers, by 1965, it had become a song by the Hondells, who's all, in all of the songs of the Hondells somehow concern Hondas and are also, which is probably why they're considered in this very strange genre of music, which is surf slash hot rod rock. So let's, let's hear some Hondells here. <laughs> We can we can stop that. That's a real earworm. I've spent many hours, unfortunately, with this song stuck in my head. Um, so as an attempt to separate out uh, outlaw motorcyclists on Harleys from ordinary people who rode Hondas, it actually worked. The image of Marlon Brando as an outlaw cyclist was soon replaced by middle class group of motorcyclists with different interests. One sign of this was not only this incredibly annoying earworm song, but also the Beach Boys song, Little Honda, which was covered by the Hondells and reached number nine on the Billboard Top 100 in 1964. In contrast to the unwieldy and heavy American cycles, Hondas were little and they didn't require much tech maintenance or technical know-how. They were also cheap. So the 250 cc, that's the engine size, model was $560 when it was introduced in 1959, which would be about $5,000 today. These prices compared favorably to other 250 cc models that were popular with dirt bikers like the German brand Mako, which offered models at $635 or $579. The British brand's Ariel, which offered a $795 model, or BSA, which offered a $610 model. While the 250cc engine would be considered tiny by some dirt bikers, small engine bikes were actually lighter and well suited to certain kinds of desert riding, especially for recreational riders who didn't really care about having the biggest engine. Buying a Honda was also an easy way to get out of town for the weekend, and this was reflected in data collected about motorcycle sales. While Hondas were only introduced into the United States in 1959, by 1970, the sales of dirt bikes alone, and this, this is bikes that cannot be ridden on roads legally, was 165,000, uh, or yeah, 165,000 thousand of approximately one million total, total motorcycle sales. In contrast, the total sales of motorcycles in 1955 was 36,000. 
And so that's, this is just like a, a massive increase, right? The motorcycle boom of the 1960s and 1970s was the highest point of motorcycle interest in America. And so like many edgy trends, motorcycling and dirt biking softened as it became mainstream, but it did, despite this ad we're looking at right now, retain its cool edge. So as we look at this ad, you can see how masculinity, motorcycling, and getting the girl, or as the ad says, going the distance, go together for this young white man, Bob, who looks like he's supposed to be a sports star. Sure, his room is a mess, but his bike, it's spotless. Um, as the ad says, and this is in the small text that you can't really read, uh, riding the motorcycle is, quote, a breeze and sheer pleasure with a friend on the back seat. We all know what that means. So these new mainstream riders claimed the same benefits of dirt biking and motorcycling as their countercultural counterparts. A hardcore biker, a rider of the Washington State Penitentiary Motorcycle Association, told Bob Bitchin, an actual journalist's name, of Cycle News that a biker's way of life is, quote, freedom. That great feeling you get as you put down the street on your sled, oblivious to all the cares and worries of the regular world. Fundamentally, this freedom was about escaping the cares of everyday life, not about feeling successful or validated through work, to think back to our man in the gray flannel suit. But even though we have, you know, these sort of like, uh, you know, a penitentiary rider saying that he gets freedom from the bike. We also hear this from much less militant or much less countercultural riders. Donetta Adams, um, a mother, testified at a Bureau of Land Management hearing about how she was concerned about losing the desert as a place to ride with her family and friends, a group she describes as six adults and seven children. She says that she goes out to the desert on her motorcycle for the same reason as everyone else for, quote, the freedom, solitude, and beauty of the desert. She insists that as a member of Defenders of Wildlife, that she loves desert animals and plants as much as anyone else and stays on the roads unless an open area where she is not, unless she's in an open area where she doesn't have to stay on the roads. For her and for the penitentiary rider both, their reasons are ostensibly the same, the American call of freedom. And just to understand the scope of the expansion of interest in dirt biking, uh, we can look to this sort of bizarre and interesting documentary on any Sunday. Any dirt biker who lived through that era loves to reference this 1971 movie either as a sign of how the sport had become mainstream or as their inspiration for starting dirt biking in the first place. Even non-dirt bikers, mostly old men in archives, like one who guided me through the collection at the San Bernardino City Library, told me how it's the only movie they've actually seen twice in theaters. Repeat, popularly repeated lore of the film says that kids would buy one ticket to go see it and then hide in the bathroom at the movie theater to go watch the next showing. The opening minutes of the film make this point precisely, buoyed by an obnoxiously chipper and jingle-like song, apparently something that's common to songs about dirt biking in the 1960s and 1970s. It's a depiction of how Bruce Brown, its director, wanted to show dirt biking as a harmless hobby taken up by enthusiastic neighborhood boys. get a sense for both how this is like uh maybe it's just like something about the 70s when all songs have to be obnoxious earworms but uh that that is what this feels like 
So the stars of this film are not these little boys who actually, you know, are like screaming engine sounds at the introduction, um, but these big stars in dirt biking like Malcolm Smith. However, it was financed by an even bigger star, the movie star Steve McQueen, a.k.a. the King of Cool, who sponsored the production. Old-time dirt bikers love to say that they met Steve McQueen and used to ride with him, but they, they knew the real McQueen, not the movie star version of himself. Regardless, On Any Sunday remains one of, if not the best, motorcycle documentary of all time, and it was nominated for a 1972 Academy Award. And of course, at this time, it wasn't just Hondas out there anymore. Companies like Yamaha had reformed their Hells Angels associations through positive advertising, and a long list of bikes appeared in the film, including Triumphs, Montessas, Harley Davidsons, Hondas, Yamahas, Suzuki's, BSAs, Voltakas, and a Hodaka. Um, while the film is often credited with the mainstreaming of dirt biking, the reality is that it was actually just expanding the audience for what was a growing trend in California. In a 1967 report, which was the first of its kind, the Bureau of Land Management in California attempted to understand the impact of motorcycles on public lands as the rise of the motorcycle exploded. As they collected statistics, they found that there were 95 desert riding clubs organized through the American Motorcycle Association with an average of about 100 members each, with 45 to 50 competitive riding events held on public land each year, estimated entrance in desert events numbered around 15,000 people. Adding in the non-competitive riding for fun group, the Bureau estimated that 130,000 to 140,000 people rode in the desert each year, which is not including the family members or spectators who might drive out with a camper to just watch the events. On one page, they show a map of what a desert race south of Barstow actually looks like, probably covering at least 150 miles, as did most one-day races. The race has three loops that mostly cover public lands. And if you look here, you can actually see that the shaded in gray portions are the public lands portions and that the other parts are private land. And I can talk all day about like why it looks all checkerboarded like this, but we're going to spare you all of my railroad talk for today, unless you want to ask about it in the Q&A. Um, and so they just, for this map, they just picked one of many races that were happening on public lands in Southern California. Other races included one from Barstow to Vegas. We're going to talk about that one later. Um, another covered the Eastern Mojave in California by um, Parker, Arizona. And then another one was at Big Bear. These events were very popular and very large. And what was clear to the Bureau of Land Management was that they actually couldn't contend with the size and scale of these events and also the conflicts that came with them. Ranchers complained that bikers were spooking their cows and their sheep and conservationists and hikers complained that motorcycles were ruining the quiet enjoyment of public lands and eroding the soil to boot. So the Bureau closes this 1967 report with a question of what can be done about the problem of public lands conflict and motorcycling, noting that, quote, at the present time, BLM does not have the capability for resolving this problem. There is not adequate knowledge about the extent of motorcycle impact or its results, end quote. Further, they argue the system is just not built to deal with this kind of use. The adjacent page to this conclusion shows an ominous vision, which is where all the large population centers in California and where they're going to go to ride. So you can see that the stars are where they're going to ride, and then the population centers are represented by the motorcyclists, right? So we have the Bay Area, Sacramento, Fresno, Bakersfield, LA, San Diego, and where they're going. And I'm happy to talk more about where people are riding. Which brings us to part three, conflict over biking, 1970 to 1980. The 1967 report highlighted what was going to become a much more vicious fight about dirt biking and its effects on public lands. 
Papers from the Sierra Club at the Bancroft Library indicate how in the 1960s, the growing environmentalist movement was starting to take issue with the emergence of dirt bikes and pack vehicles, which would often appear in areas soon to be designated as federal wilderness and therefore off limits to vehicular use. One of these vehicles was the rhyming tote goat, which I only include because of its absurd name. This vehicle promised access to trails deep in wilderness or really just anywhere. You can see, right, that there's like a deer that's on the vehicle in their advertisement, um, a dead deer, presumably. These new kinds of vehicles were just like motorcycles, um, except for they off sometimes they would add a third utility wheel. Um, they were already so prevalent in the wilderness areas near Tahoe that before the boom, the motorcycle boom in the 60s, in 1961, the Forest Service published regulations prohibiting them from certain areas. Ordinary Sierra Clubbers and famous ones alike wrote letters to the main um, Sierra Club organization in San Francisco about their hatred of these vehicles, including this letter from Ansel Adams, which I've included here. Um, they complained about how these vehicles could go anywhere, trampling vegetation and making new trails where there used to be none. Sierra Clubber's complaints were both recreational and environmental. While scientists were finding that the vehicles were bad for plants and animals by da damaging soil crusts and subsequently causing erosion, Sierra Clubbers were telling stories of their own horrible run-ins with dirt bikers and jeepers in the backcountry. One of my favorite stories of this is from a guy who hikes 15 miles to a lake for solitude backpacking, only to find a noisy motorcyclist already there. Basically a backpacker's worst nightmare. While well, these kinds of debates led in part to the passage of the Wilderness Act in 1964, which was written by a conservationist, Howard Zanheiser, problems persisted in many of these areas designated as wilderness study areas under the Wilderness Act. And these problems um, had to be dealt with groups by, dealt by, groups like the Bureau of Land Management had to deal with these problems. Um, and these are like the federal agencies that are just least staffed and capable of being able to deal with these problems. Um, and so, in 1968, as a response to this 1967 report that we just looked at, the California State Bureau of Land Management Director, Russell Penny, proposed that a ranger force be established in order to control growing recreational uses. The first of its kind, the BLM's desert rangers were given, given law enforcement capabilities in 1971 under Richard Nixon. The program expanded when the BLM finally got an official mandate under the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act, FLIPMA, in 1976. In addition to formalizing the BLM's law enforcement capabilities, FLIPMA was a truly sweeping transformation of federal lands. In the California desert, it established a massive area, the California Desert Conservation Area that you can see on the screen here, that is 25 million acres. That is a quarter of the state of California, just to give you a little glance into that, right? It also made the CDCA into an experiment in land use planning in which public hearings throughout the state would be organized and carefully transcribed into long documents that would be made part of the desert plan. Scores of scientists were hired to understand desert ecology and the impact of people on the desert, and they wrote lengthy reports that today gather dust in BLM offices that I have inhaled. The public hearings had a different destination, the National Archives in Riverside. Reading these public hearings, the contours of these debates sort of follow along what you would expect based on what I've already told you. Environmentalists emphasize the growing scientific consensus that off-road vehicles were destroying the environment and creating lasting negative effects on cultural and historic desert resources. There was a crowd of vehicular enthusiasts who blamed the bad apples for the destruction of archeological and sacred sites and protected plants, arguing that responsible users like them should still have access to the desert. And finally, there is a group of off-road riders who insisted that there's nothing to save in the desert anyway, saying things like, how much is there to tear up? It's just dirt, there's not much beauty. Um, some of these people actually questioned if the if motorcycles could destroy the the desert at all, saying things like, 
quote, please remember, we do not abuse the desert we love. Dawn will find yesterday's fun swept away in an evening breeze, end quote. And so these are these are themes, obviously. We're gonna, they're just gonna recur forever. While this last group of off-roaders believe that in ideas of the desert that are known to be untrue today, the conflicts of these public hearings just proved how divisive public lands could be. As the plan was put into place, areas formerly open or that allowed for less restrictive vehicular use were closed off or made more restrictive, which was for environmentalists a victory. However, for the most dedicated and most radical off-roaders, this was a loss and fueled what had already begun as one of the most contentious debates over vehicular land use in the California desert, which is the Barstow to Vegas race. Which brings us to part four. Some people called Barstow to Vegas, quote, the granddaddy of all motorcycling events. However, it was not the oldest enduro, which is a long distance dirt biking event, or it wasn't the most scenic either. When I talked to dirt biking old timers, they admitted it wasn't the best, nicest, or the most pleasant course to ride. The route loosely paralleled I-15 between Barstow and Las Vegas, and it was annually run on Thanksgiving weekend. Even though it was not scenic, B2B did have something going for it, which was controversy. In 1974, the eighth running of the race resulted in so much environmental damage that the Bureau of Land Management refused to permit the race in 1975. And this is before FLIPMA, which just sort of indicates how big of a deal this is. Um, in response, a group of dirt bikers led by Lewis McKay, a, a Fontana electrician better known by his anti-government moniker, the Phantom Duck of the Desert. McKay painted himself as an ordinary man, added, as did his friend, Rick Simon, who called himself super hunky and an inversion of the slur hunky, which had been used against uh, Polish laborers. While both of them presented themselves as working class men, Rick, for example, was born and raised in Ohio and served in the military before chasing his California dream. Their actions were about to make them stand out among the many dirt bikers. In this pamphlet, you can, this is from the National Archives, you can see um, this is actually a response to the federal government decision to stop Barstow to Vegas. Um, if the problem was that BLM refused to permit the race, then he would organize this free, no entry fee, unorganized trail ride in which many people would be encouraged to ride in the desert, but not in a group together. When the Bureau of Land Management issued an order that groups of 50 persons or more constituted a violation of the denied permit, McKay carefully modified his invitations, all of which were sent from a P.O. box his aunt rented on his behalf with the word quack quack emblazoned on the top of the return address to say that no one should ride in such a large group. And you can see here, there's a, this is a supporter who sent a letter to the Phantom Duck. Um, that is saying about how, uh, you know, how the phantom duck did not encourage anyone to break the law. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the 1975 unorganized trail ride and then the following unorganized trail rides, um, as you can see in 1978, there was another trail ride. Um, the all of these controversial rides uh, resulted in a federal prosecutor pursuing the Phantom Duck and his friends for having the trail ride anyway. And these are the materials that I'm showing you from the National Archives. The case eventually ended in sort of like a wash, but dirt bikers didn't forget this double betrayal from the federal government, first denying the permit and then uh, going after and prosecuting the Phantom Duck. In the 1980s, McKay's friend Rick Simon, the founder of Dirt Bike Magazine, founded the Sahara Club, which is a militant off-roading organization whose name was supposed to spur the animosity and hatred of the similarly named Sierra Club. Here are two images from his newsletter, and you can glean his anti-environmentalist sentiment from these two images. By the 1990s, the organization, which had been active since the 1980s, um, which when it was working with wise use activists and uh, bankrolled covertly by corporations, 
Um, the organization sued the federal government in court, claiming that their right to ride on public lands was covered under the right to peacefully protest under the First Amendment of the Constitution. As another writer put it during the FLIPMA hearings, quote, since we first came to this country, we have gone everywhere and anywhere and by any means that has been available to us. In this quote, you can see how this rider is emphasizing how unfair it seemed when areas when they used to ride would be closed for apparently no reason. As another prominent uh, activist, Ed Waldheim put it, quote, people have been giving input through these meetings up and down the state for the last five, six months. And at every meeting, be it of the advisory committee, wherever they're putting input in, but we feel like it really, nothing is coming about it. Nothing is being done about it. There is a set plan under the disguise that Congress told us to do this, and they're just going to go ahead and do it. It seems like they don't really care. When I say they, I'm talking about the people who are running the whole thing, end quote. Ed Waldheim's refusal to name the they, the people running the whole thing, makes it seem like there's some kind of puppeteer behind the whole show, hiding himself from the ordinary people like Ed. The notion that Ed Waldheim and the Phantom Duck and the Sahara Club expressed was the disenfranchised feeling that Nixon called the silent majority in 1969. Their sense that the rights to which they were entitled was being usurped by a group of elites who aimed to enjoy the desert for themselves rather than share it with others was reflective of how, of, reflected their hatred of environmentalists who wanted to keep them out or bureaucrats who they saw as being power hungry. What they saw in their everyman rights to ride in the desert as they always had was a sense of freedom that we heard earlier from the on-road riders. They saw that these rights to what they thought was freedom were being challenged by new regulations and the, and, um, the new knowledge of the destructiveness of dirt biking on desert ecology. Yet, and here I wanna just emphasize this point, people like Ed, Rick, and the Phantom Duck were outliers and radicals among dirt bikers and off-highway vehicle uh, people, as we will see in the conclusion. Rick Simon, one of the close friends of the Phantom Duck and the founder of Dirt Bike Magazine, sat in his living room in Maricopa County, Arizona, in the far outskirts of Phoenix a couple years ago. As I joined him, he offered me a bush light and offered and motioned for me to sit down in the chair next to a table on which he had put the three guns that he recently acquired in a barter for a Mako motorcycle he had just restored. He told me that his mechanical tinkering almost made up for the fact that he can't really ride anymore. His 80 year old bones, obviously not of this picture, are no longer up to it. As we look through some of his old dirt bike magazine memorabilia on the computer, he also told me about the places where he used to ride. One of them was the El Mirage dry lake bed. While it had been a place for setting land speed records in the 1930s, Rick remembered it as a place to ride. At the same moment that Flipma happened, a fence went up around El Mirage and dirt bikers were charged a small fee for entering the place that used to be free, which rankled Rick. He saw the new fences as an impingement on his freedom and cut them down in protests like the other actions he had staged against the federal government and environmentalists. But even as Rick was willing to bring out bolt, bolts, cutters, and other implements to get rid of fences, others were not. When I was at his house, he called a friend, Chris, on the phone to corroborate his story. They don't know what freedom was, Chris said, and he told me that all of the new people just were giving up in what they called the war against BLM, the war between BLM and the off-roaders. This war eventually was settled by off-roaders agreeing to the new rules and the war of attrition environmentalists had won. While Rick and Chris were sad that the desert was no longer open to ride, they also knew that their bodies would no longer allow them to do what they used to. As they both told me about how it used to be, how great it was back then, they didn't bother with actually talking about the present. Instead, they consciously decided to live in the past rather than updating their lives to the new reign of environmentalism. Chris put it best when he said that he had a photographic memory of El Mirage the way it used to be. I can go back whenever I want, he said. The reason why I end here with two old men reminiscing about their past lives to me 
is not really to glorify their past through their experience. Instead, it's a reflection and a reminder of the way that times have dramatically changed over the last 50 years. Today, we know about the negative impact of dirt biking and off-roading on desert ecology, and public sentiment to protect the California desert is much more mainstream than it was 50 years ago. Today, dirt biking, though still popular among some groups, no longer shares its widespread appeal among Americans, and it's become a much more expensive hobby than what Rick and Chris used to do. And I can, I can give you all the numbers on that if you really want. On any Sunday, you might find a race, but dirt biking is no longer in its golden days. So with that, I am happy to answer anyone's questions. There's a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the talk, so I'm more than happy to share that with everyone. So there we go. Oh, I can't hear you, Gabachia. All right, um, I'm going to start answering the questions in the Q&A, and then I can try to return back to some of the questions that are also in the chat. Um, so some questions of, um, so we have a question from Laura about uh, the Hondells in industrial musicals. So industrial musicals, for those who are not in the know, is it was this sort of bizarre genre where the musical format was actually uh, shifted so that, um, you know, different companies, so it might be like General Motors, for example, or Ford, would stage these giant spectacular musicals for everyone who worked for them. And um, they would be themed based on the products that the company actually made, right? And so it was like this form of, you know, making their workers feel better, which is a very post-war obsession. Um, so the Hondells, I, I did spend a little bit of time looking into them. And what seems very odd is that there's not an obvious industry connection other than the name and the fact that all of their songs are about Hondas. And so my thought is that maybe they did get some sort of money under the table or something like that. They only had like, I think maybe one record in one EP or two records. So they had a relatively short catalog. Um, I think, I mean, I think what they point to, even though I can't, you know, pinpoint how they related to the company directly is the ubiquity of Hondas as a particular kind of motorcycle that people really loved in that era. Um, yeah, so that, that would be sort of my comparison. There's also sort of this genre question um, that is implicit in the industrial musicals Hondas comparison but I just think there's just something that is so obnoxiously cheery about surfer rock. And then also sort of relatedly um, the, uh, yeah, the, like the hot rod rock, which seemed to come out of surfer rock that I just think that's all sort of part of the same story. So then also in the Q and A, um, we have a question from Kitty, which is about the checkerboard pattern and the Southern Pacific Railroad. And so it is a railroad land grant. It is not the Southern Pacific. So this zone of the desert, um, the Southern Pacific is the Coachella Valley is, is where the Southern Pacific came through. And then the checkerboard pattern by Barstow is actually Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe which prior to that was also known as the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad, but it's the same phenomenon, different railroad. For everyone who might be wondering what's happening, in order to finance the railroads, the federal government came up with this brilliant scheme, which did not work in the desert, which was that they were going to give the railroads every other section, so a section is 640 acres, right? It's like a little square, 
and they were going to, um, or rather, yeah, they were, and so they're going to divide up the desert into this little checkerboard. Half of it's owned by the federal government, half of it is owned by the railroad. And this, the idea was that the railroad was going to sell all of its land to homesteaders and they were going to homestead in the desert. And then it was going to raise the value of the government land. So then they would buy it from the government. It did not work because no one bought the railroad land in the desert um, because it just wasn't very appealing to people, um, which is why you have this checkerboard pattern um, that persisted. Although obviously some portions did get bought up as you could have seen in that image. Okay. Um, so I have a question that is about the demonstrable damage from Barstow to Las Vegas. So um, this is a really, um, this is a really big question that is about uh, science and the nature of science and soil erosion. So I will point you to Howard Wilshire, who um, is a USGS geologist. He's a professional. He deals with soil erosion. He's done a number of studies about the impacts of motorcycles and also of other vehicular uses on public lands. Um, and so some of the, just to give you sort of like an overview of that, because I have not independently done this. I rely on Howard Wilshire because he's considered to be an expert in that field. Um, so just to give you some ideas of like the, the general geological phenomena that we're talking about um, in terms of soil erosion. So what happens is that the most of the desert is, there's a little thing called the soil crust that is on top of the desert. This is what keeps the desert from like literally blowing away, right? So like when people think about deserts, they think about sand, the soil is sandy, but it's not like the desert actually like blows away every day, right? The whole desert is not a sand dune. And so that's why, so we, so there's this thing called the soil crust. There's like all these little microbiota, right? They all live in the soil and that's what keeps the soil crust together. What happens when you drive a vehicle or many vehicles or many, especially many vehicles in the same spot over a period of time is that you break down the soil crust. This means that Basically, all of the little microbiota that's living in the soil, that all dies, or they're stressed out and don't do as good of a job as they normally would do. And as a result, you have a lot more erosion. Erosion can be bad for um, like particular kinds of desert environment. Another thing that it will do is it makes it harder for plants to actually live in the desert because plants rely on this sort of like substrate of microbiota in the um, soil crust. And so as a result, you have plants that can't like stay in the same place um, where they normally would be living. And then subsequently you also have the animals are affected. So that's sort of like one layer, right? This is like the soil layer. And so I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of the impacts of it on animals. Um, and so there are a couple of different kinds of desert animals that are protected by federal law. So that would include um, if we're, thinking about um, like the desert tortoise, which is federally listed as threatened, or the kangaroo rat, which is also listed. And these creatures can be very affected by uh, changes to their conditions, right? So if we think about, for example, the desert tortoise, desert tortoises evolved like three to five million years ago. That's a long time ago. The Mojave used to be more like actually like a jungle back then. And so one of the weird things about the desert tortoise is that they actually, they have like these needs, the desert does not really provide for them, right? They like need fresh water every year, for example. They also live 80% of their lives underground in these burrows. And so what happens when you have a vehicle driving over a desert tortoise burrow is that it can collapse the burrow. It makes the tor it really hard for the tortoise to get out for the times when it needs to drink its water and use up all of its energy to try to escape. Um, and so these are just like two sort of like simple examples. There's a huge amount of research that is about the impacts of not only dirt bikes, but other forms of vehicular activity on the desert. And I can, I could give you lots of sites. There are many, many books on this. So, okay, cool. Um, all right. To what extent did the history of off-roading influence the formations of environmental impact reports as we know them today? 
It's a good question. Um, and so environmental impacts reports as a form actually emerged in part, it, so it came through NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, which was passed in 1970. Um, and so it's part of sort of like this environmentalist decade of which FLIPMA is also a part. And so FLIPMA was one of these moments and then the California desert conservation area where you're really, the government is like trying out all of these forms for understanding like, how are we going to think about environmental impacts in these different places when we're proposing projects? For example, whether or not we should have this dirt biking race. And so, um, the reason why the 1975 Barstow Vegas race was not permitted was actually an early iteration or like one of the first couple of iterations of this environmental impact reporting. And so um, if you look back at this old paperwork, it's actually quite interesting because uh, so like environmental impact reports today, for example, like I look at, I've looked at a recent one for another part of my research and we're talking like tens of thousands of pages. They're really quite massive. These old environmental impact reports are much shorter and then they also, um, but they tend to have sort of like the same categories, right? So like they're starting to establish these categories like, oh, like soil impacts, that's one thing we wanna look at. Impacts on other recreationalists, that's another thing we wanna look at as they're trying to balance all of these different priorities, which is also part of the demand placed on the Bureau of Land Management, right? To balance different recreational activities. So, okay. Um, all right, so we have a question about mountain biking versus dirt biking. So this is an interesting question, obviously. So there's like this weird moment in the 1910s when motorcycles, like off-road motorcycling is emerging as a sport. And um, at that moment, it seems like there are actually some people who are just on bicycles who are doing that, but that doesn't really get taken into what we think of today as like the mountain biking movement which really started much more in uh, like the North Bay in California, Marin County in I think the 1960s and 1970s, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and so the mountain biking, what's interesting about mountain biking is that because it is a mechanized activity, but not a motorized activity, there's like a distinction where there are some places where mountain biking is allowed and some places where mountain biking is not allowed. So in wilderness areas, for example, you cannot have a, a mechanized thing. So you can't be riding your mountain bike in wilderness unless there's like an exemption that's cut out. There's a ton of like Supreme Court cases on this. It's a real rabbit hole. Um, and so there is sort of like this weird category where it's like some places allow mechanized but not motorized. Um, but for the most part, it actually lines up. And so there's been a lot of controversy over the last uh, three or four years, um, particularly about sort of like the line between mechanized and motorized in terms of e-biking, um, which is electronically assisted uh, biking, right? Which there are different kinds of e-bikes, but we don't need to talk about all of that. All right. Um, so we have a question about the future um, look like for the California desert. Good news, bad news. Oh man, that is a very big, big question. Um, so I will answer this in terms of this specific topic, which is dirt biking and off-highway vehicle use. So I think that there has actually been a lot of good work um, where like people seem to be more on the same page about um, like the, the appropriate and inappropriate, potentially inappropriate uses of dirt biking in the California desert. So I know that there is another question about whether um, dirt biking is banned in the desert. And so there are these different categories of land in the desert. 
that um, help determine where you're allowed to go on uh, like on a dirt bike or other motorized vehicle and where you're not allowed to go. And so basically the main categories is there's like a uh, category where you there, there are sort of three main categories. One is you have to have a street legal vehicle to drive on the road here. So that's one category. Think of that like your highway. And then you have a middle category, which is you do not have to have a street legal vehicle, but you do have to stay on the road. And so this is sort of like the big over encompassing designation for a lot of the California desert, right? It's stay on the road, but you can ride your dirt bike. And then there's a third category where there are these special areas where dirt bikes, trucks, whatever you have, um, can ATVs, for example, can be ridden anywhere. Um, and so you could you could ride it over a cactus if you think that's a good idea, which most of the time it's not a good idea. Um, and so there are these different sort of like land use classes and um, there are several different areas throughout the desert. Some of them people like more than others. Um, and so a couple of the big ones are Glamis, which are sand dunes. And then there's also the Johnson area, which is uh, between Yucca Valley and between uh, and the Lucerne Valley. So, um, and they actually host a really, one of the biggest off-roading events in California, um, which is called the King of the Hammers. So yeah, so there is a question about state vehicular recreation areas. And so basically, um, as I discussed in the talk, um, there, like, so there was sort of this like moment before 1967 where there were just no rules, right? Like people would just go to certain areas and they would ride there because like no one would harass them to get off because it wasn't private property. Um, and so there were certain areas that were already sort of like popular hotspots. And so in this 1967 BLM report, for example, they talk about the Pinoche Hills, which is um, sort of, it's like near where Pinnacles National Park is now, but um, closer to the valley. And so the establishment of areas that were sort of like popularly used and then got made into these sort of like formally used areas was a result of these sorts of planning processes. So basically they said, okay, well, like this is great. There are lots of places where you want to go, but we cannot make the whole desert into a place where people can just be riding their dirt bikes anywhere because it's like not safe. It's also just, uh, you, it causes a lot of conflict, like the kind that I talked about um, with ranchers and also with uh, uh, other recreationalists. And so the decision was basically, we will make certain areas that are like more free play zones. And so it was sort of like a spatial compromise of off-roading. That's sort of how I would talk about it. Um, okay, so then we have a question about uh, cultural understandings of the desert. So I think one of the really interesting things about um, the, about sort of like how people talk about the desert and the difference between how people talk about the desert like back then and today is that um, there's an understanding, I would say today that's more prevalent about the ways that vehicular use can actually cause certain kinds of environmental damage to the desert. Obviously not everyone agrees on every point in this category, um, but in general, there is an acknowledgement that um, vehicular use is like not really good for desert ecosystems. Desert ecosystems are pretty fragile um, and they don't really like come back quickly uh, once they've been damaged. They have really long time spans because there's not a lot of rain. Plants take forever to grow back. All the animals take forever to come back. And so you're dealing with like this super fragile ecosystem. And so um, I think that one of the big shifts, and this is in part because of the sort of like rise in environmentalism in general, that lots of people acknowledge how the desert uh, is a fragile place, um, that 
maybe we should not be riding everywhere in. Um, and so th I think that's like a really big shift and you can actually see that um, if you sort of read through the public comments on um, like between sort of like the 1950s and now, although we have a much smaller repository of comments before these sorts of like federal processes that started in the 1970s. So, okay, that's all the questions in the Q and A. Um, I'm gonna just very quickly, I can look back. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat that we need to answer. Um, hi, can you hear me now? <laughs> Yeah, it works. <laughs> Great. So I think I was able to pull those into the cool. questions. So I think and I hope that everybody's questions have been answered. Uh, thank you, Julia, for another wonderful presentation and also for taking over the whole question <laughs> section um, uh, for me. So thank you, everyone, for being here with us tonight. I'm just uh, pasting a couple of important links on the chat so that you can continue to support our programming. We do a lecture every second Friday of the month for like seven more months. So we hope to see you again. We have a very wide variety of topics coming up. So you can visit our website for more information on that. And we always appreciate your donations. We appreciate your support on social media. And uh, if you want to catch replays on our YouTube channel from uh, previous events, you are also welcome to go and find uh, more interesting topics. We actually have a good library of Julia's uh, talks from Desert Live this past summer. We had three different lectures with her so you can check out our youtube channel for that and more thank you again julia and i hope everybody has a great weekend yeah thanks everyone for your great questions and engagement we'll see you next time